All right, let's get started. Thank you guys so much for your patience. This is our second ever workshop that we're doing with Public Archaeology, a joint program with the Utah Cultural Site Stewardship Program. So thank you all for being here. And so many of you are stewards. Thank you for being stewards. Um, for stewards, after this presentation, we'll be going downstairs and we'll be doing some hands-on work, making some rock imagery of our own. Um, so hang on after the presentation, we'll give you some more instructions about how we're gonna move downstairs and what that's gonna look like. But for the next 30 minutes or so, may I introduce Victoria Ramirez. She is a graduate student at Utah State University and she is here because she actually earned a scholarship through the Division of State History for her fabulous work at the graduate level. So I'm very <laughs> happy to have you here, Victoria. I'm excited. So she's gonna give you a presentation today about prehistoric rock imagery here in Utah. Um, she's gonna give you a little bit of information on her thesis, and then we'll have some open time for questions and answers after. So without any further ado, I'll kick it over to Victoria. Thanks, Anne. Hi, everyone. Okay, so I'm just going to give a very brief and kind of very broad overview of rock imagery. So kind of just going over what rock imagery is, some ways that archaeologists study rock imagery and the different types we see in Utah. Um, so here I just have a basic definition of what is rock imagery, also known as rock art. Or kind of, right, you might hear me joke with both uh, terminologies throughout this presentation. Um, rock imagery is human-made marks on natural non-portable non rocky surfaces. Um, it's kind of an all-encompassing term for paintings and engravings seen on like canyon walls, boulders, um, and uh, like alcoves and rock shelters. There are two technical types of rock imagery. So you have pictographs, also known as rock paintings. Um, rock paintings were produced by the application of paint onto stone. Um, and pigments are made using a variety of um, minerals and mixed with organic binders. And I'll go into that a little bit later once we get closer towards the end of the presentation and towards like the hands on portion. And we also have pic, uh, petroglyphs. So, petroglyphs are produced by cutting away at the rock surface. Um, so, sandstone is usually and sometimes covered by like this darker weathered surface called patina. Um, so, people would have been pecking. Um, scratching, abrading, or carving these images onto stone, um, removing that dark patina to expose some of the lighter <laughs> rock beneath. There are two categories that elements or motifs of rock imagery fall under. So the one you have representational. Representational motifs kind of depict like real life forms. So anthropomorphic figures, which are also like human looking like figures, quadrupeds, snakes, bows and arrows and so on and then you have abstract which is like basically the complete opposite of that so abstract elements or styles do not represent like real life images so you have a kind of these abstract shapes um and symbols so like lines and so on okay so why do archaeologists care about rock art and like what can we gather from rock art to archaeologists um Rock art basically provides information on pre-contact cosmologies and ideologies. Understanding different rock art styles can also provide information on cultural boundaries, cultural relationships, patterns of communication, and evidence of trade. Um, archaeologists see rock imagery as a material expression of kind of human concepts and thoughts and ideologies. So it's a really important aspect of the archaeological record to study. Okay. So there's different ways that archaeologists study rock imagery. There's like not one ultimate way to study it. There's uh, uh, different approaches exist to doing this. So one of the like one of the most common ones you might see, and archaeologists do this a lot, is style. So the very basic like concept of style in archaeology is that culture is pattern and that any art of a cultural group conforms to the confines of a style or limited range of styles. 
Um, these style categories are used to organize rock art and other archaeological materials and designs for the purposes of description, comparison, and interpretation. Um, style categories are frequently used by archaeologists and not just for rock imagery, but you know, they're also used for like pottery and other types of archaeological material. Um, rock art styles have been assigned to the archaic period, um, to like the farming cultures of the ancestral Pueblo and Fremont, and also to like the historic period of Utah. Um, archaeologists use the techniques manufactured to make the rock art, so like whether it's painted, like pecked or painted, um, kind of the subject matter to the content of the rock imagery, uh, the attributes of the rock imagery, the locations, the themes, and their relationship to one another to create these style categories. Um, so right here is just a map that I took from Chassa, it's a really good book, I have it at the very end, um, kind of defining these like different areas. Um, another way is through interpretation. Um, interpretation of rock art designs is extremely difficult and sometimes like impossible. Um, however, it can be achieved through combining archaeological documentation and ethnographic research. Um, when it comes to interpretation, uh, we're kind of referring to the uh, cultural meanings behind some of these images. Um, and for that, historic and ethnographic data is very important. Um, so like interviewing um, people today that are connected to these sites of the past is really important to understanding and interpreting some of this um, rock imagery. Kind of like a form of interpretation is through understanding the function of a rock imagery site. So understanding the function of um, a rock art site can be done by using the contents of the panel, so like the imagery itself. Um, other pre-contact remains, so if there's an architectural site nearby or if um, there's like associated artifacts with this rock imagery site, um, the geographic feature, so where is it located on the landscape, um, and the site itself. Understanding how sites function um, aid archaeologists in reconstructing the lives of these pre-contact groups. So then there's dating. Dating a rock imagery is extremely difficult. Um, however, archeologists have come up with like several methods for relative dating of rock art sites and research is ongoing to create like the absolute methods for dating rock art. Um, one method is relying on other archeological materials and features found in association with rock imagery. So if you're near an architectural site that has some wood that you can date or there's pottery nearby, um, and that's a way to date that rock imagery site. Uh, there's also comparing rock imagery motifs found at rock sites to motifs found in pottery, textiles, um, and basketry that are datable. So like those can be datable and that's how we can date these rock imagery motifs. Sometimes the content is tied to an event um, so the introduction of the bow and arrow in the Southwest, that's like only the marker that we can use. I used to work at Canyon de Shea National Monument in Northeast Arizona, and there's this really amazing panel of the Spanish missionaries and conquistadors coming into the canyon, um, which at that point we know, okay, so like it was when the Spanish came in. So that's like a good way to date rock art. Another, um, other methods have been Luminescence dating of sediments, trying to date the patina or desert varnish that kind of grows over the rock imagery, um, dating mineral deposits or lichen growth on that, um, and even trying to like radiocarbon date organic uh, pigments or binders that were on the rock imagery. Um, so those are all kind of some methods that we date them. Okay. So now for different rock art styles of Utah. I did mix it all of them because there's a lot. <laughs> so I kind of just went over some of the more, I guess, like well-known rock art styles of Utah. Um, the earliest styles can be dated to the archaic period, which starts around um, 5,500 BC into 1 AD. And I'm going to keep the dates just very abstract because like I said right before, rock art is very, very hard to date. 
Um, so in this period, we see the Great Basin abstract style, which is kind of seen all over the Colorado Plateau. You see it into the Great Basin, Southwest, and even Plains. Um, so there's that one. Um, a variation of that style could also be the Chihuahuan archaic polychrome abstract style. In books, sometimes it's kind of combined with the other ones, sometimes separated. Um, but this one was using um, minerals to create the rock imagery rather than just kind of petroglyphs. We see the Glen Canyon style, uh, Glen Canyon Linear style, also used to be known as Glen Canyon style five. Um, this one is seen in the area of Glen Canyon um, on, the Colorado, on the Colorado River around Utah and Arizona. And I feel like this is probably the more like well-known rock imagery of Utah, very Canyon style. Um, we see Bear Canyon style um, throughout like the northern part of the Grand Canyon in Arizona into like Northwest Colorado, all over Utah, and then like um, in the northern part of the Colorado Plateau. Um, and these figures, I think, are pretty well known because like these designs are so. Is that they're very big anthropomorphic designs with really elaborate decorations. We also see different styles for the farming tradition, farming cultures of Utah. So we have the ancestral Pueblo. Um, and the ancestral Pueblo is broken up into the chronology is broken up to what we call the basic classification, which um, like a little brief history lesson at the Pecos classification of the Coast at the first Pecos conference um, in 1967 by A.B. Kidder. And it kind of breaks up the chronology of um, the ancestral Pueblo into Basque and Acre 2, Basque and Acre 3, Pueblo 1, Pueblo 2, Pueblo 3. So these different time periods within the ancestral Pueblo culture. Um, so in Basque and Acre 2, we see the San Juan and style, which is shot here in the picture. Um, it's kind of, I think, at least according to what I've read, it is kind of the oldest rock art style associated with the ancestral Pueblo. And then into Basket Maker um, 3, Pueblo 2, we start to see other types. So we have the cave valley representational style, which is seen in um, what is called like the central version of Hyanta region. Um, aside from being broken up into different periods, and such a Pueblo is also broken up into different regions. So in Utah, we have the Cayenta region, which is like western, southwestern Utah, and then we also have the Virgin Cayenta, which is like eastern, southwestern Utah. No, sorry, western, southwest is the Virgin, western is southwest, and then um, Cayenta is southeast. There we go. <laughs> uh, so this is like in the central part of it all. And then um, Late Pueblo <laughs> 2, Late Pueblo 3, we do start to see those Cayenta um, regional styles of rock imagery in Utah. Um, throughout Utah, we see the Fremont. Um, the Fremont were around AD 300 to AD 1300. Um, and the Fremont are separated into five different like regional variants. So you have the Uinta Basin, you have um, the San, San Rafael, you have the severe or severe. I don't really know how to say it. severe. Okay, <laughs> I know like the Utah things are pronounced different, so I want to make sure I'm pronouncing them right. <laughs> um, we have the Parowan, and then there's also the Salt Lake. Um, for this presentation, I included uh, the uh, the severe style of rock art that we see. Um, there's also oops, the San Rafael. The San Rafael is actually split up into zones for the rock imagery. So you have the northern and southern zones for um, their rock imagery. And then we also have the Uinta Basin and that has the classic vernal style of rock imagery, which has these anthropomorphic figures with like really elaborate like body decorations, headdress decorations. Um, and like sometimes like they have like a photo. Um, into the, we still see rock art into the historic period. So I didn't include all of them here, but we have the youth style. 
um, and the youth style, we start to see like these imagery, like this imagery, maybe starting around like pre AD 1500 onwards. Um, and then we also have um, the Navajo style in Southern Utah as well. So that's kind of just a different, like a very broad introduction to the different Navajo styles of Utah. And now that we've gone over a little bit of like why Navajo would be important to archaeologists and these different styles, I thought I'd kind of just introduce my thesis and like why I think rock art is super cool. Um, and what it could be studied for. So recent archaeological studies suggest that the Uinta Fremont communities were composed of two linguistically um, and ethnic, like ethnic distinct groups, a uh, basket maker group, so Western basket maker and Eastern basket maker who migrated into the area from the Southwest um, around AD 300. And these migrant farmer groups would have lived symbiotically with the indigenous foragers that were already there becoming the UNS of Fremont. Um, the UNS of Fremont villages would have like coalesced during a time of maize intensification, um, creating these like larger, like I guess like villages that we see with um, groups of like pit houses. Um, so Based off that research and other research that suggests that indigenous groups view their identity at smaller scales. So thinking about like the Hopi, um, Hopi people consider themselves to be a clan member first rather than like the greater Hopi. Thinking about the greater Hopi is more of like a contemporary term. Um, this hypothesis implies that ethnically distinct communities created the classic vernal style rock art seen in the Uinta Basin. So my graduate thesis research tests whether significant differences in local rock art design supports a hypothesis of community level ethnic variation among the Uinta free rock. So very basically, am I looking at different anthropomorphic figures and motifs in the Uinta Basin to see if I can um, create a more um, systematic quantitative analysis um, to figure out the frequencies of them at these different sites. So I'll be um, trying to create a methodology. Um, I'm not trying to like assign ethnicity to any of these sites. I just want to see if the frequency of these motifs um, doing through doing spatial analysis or statistical analysis. Um, will highlight how different communities would have coalesced during, like, during the fluorescence of agriculture in the Uinta Basin. Um, that's like a very quick elevator pitch of my thesis. If you guys want to ask any more questions, you can. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to turn to the end of our presentation. So I kind of wanted to go back to how rock imagery was made and the different techniques used. So for rock paintings and pictographs. Rock paintings are usually found on light colored surfaces. Um, different pigments that we see are red, white, black, orange, yellow, green, pink, blue. Um, and the paint consisted of three different components. We have the color, like the pigment, um, a binder, and a vehicle. So the pigment could have been made up of a variety of like clay, minerals, um, the ground up in preparation for mixing with other ingredients. Um, various shades of red are created, maybe red iron oxide, um, limonite could have been used for yellow, charcoal was used for black, um, you see like maybe gypsum or toss or calcium, carbon, calcium carbonate, yep, for white, um, clay minerals could have like produced more pastel looking shades. Um, and so once we had these ground up pigments, the vehicle and the binding agent were then combined with the fluid with this pigment. So it was likely that water was used to create the consistency um, that was needed for the paint. However, the binding agent is a little bit harder to identify in the archaeological records since um, we don't have any like direct evidence of it, but we have used ethnographic data to suggest what some of those binding agents could have been. Um, potentially yucca tooth I saw, water and white bean meal, pinion gum, um, egg whites 
to them also been used to kind of create this paint to be able to like stick onto the wall. Um, so before application, um, we're assuming that maybe the sandstone could have been kind of like smoothed over. Um, people <laughs> possibly used brushes made from yucca fibers uh, to create some really fine lines and designs. Um, I saw some little, maybe even corn husks could have been used to create some more like fodder pattern. Um, and of course like fingers and maybe even like spraying of paint onto the wall. So that's pictographs and rock paintings. For petroglyphs, the usual method to produce petroglyphs was done by pecking. And this pecking was done by like a direct flow of usually a hammer stone onto the wall. Um, this didn't really kind of, it didn't create very precise lines. So if you wanted to create some more finer and precise lines, you could have used a hammer stone and a chisel. So you can see a little kind of this method. Um, another method for making petroglyphs was incising or scratching a design into the rock with a very sharp tool, um, kind of getting those like really deep lines for incising and scratching could have just um, been done over the surface. Um, and as we see in a lot of rock imagery, specifically petroglyph panels, a lot of different methods were used for like the same exact motif. So one motif could have a bunch of abrasion on it um, with very incised lines to outline it. Um, so we, they were using a variety of methods. Um, and that is it for my presentation. <laughs> this is a very general introduction into the rock industry. Um, I know that was a lot, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask.